You know, for over a hundred years, just one single piece of granite has been at the heart of this huge debate. It's fueled all sorts of wild theories about lost ancient technology, so today we're gonna dive in and try to unwrap this century-old mystery of the granite core. And really, it all boils down to this one pretty provocative question. Did the ancient Egyptians use power tools? I mean, did the builders of the pyramids have some kind of technology that was way beyond what we give them credit for? Some people are absolutely convinced the answer is yes, and that it's locked away inside the grooves of this one kinda unassuming artifact. Okay, so this is it. Meet core number seven. It was found in Giza, and it's this piece of red granite that was drilled out of a bigger block. But here's the thing. It has these markings on it that are so precise, so weird, that they've had researchers and engineers scratching their heads for well over a century. All right, to really get what all the fuss is about, we've got to go back, way back, right to the very beginning, to the famous archaeologist who first found this thing and made some claims that, well, they seem to fly in the face of everything we thought we knew about ancient Egyptian tools. So the key to this whole mystery, really, is in the specific language used by the guy who found it, W.M. Flinders Petrie, all the way back in 1884. I mean, he wasn't wishy-washy about it at all. He described a true screw thread. Think about that, a perfect spiral. That implies some kind of machine-like process, something that should have been totally impossible for that time. So Petrie's whole argument was basically built on four key observations. You could call them his four theses. And these have become the bedrock of this whole ancient high-tech theory. He said the core had a perfect spiral, that the grooves were continuous, that they had a stable depth, and that they were cut with this constant, super precise pitch. Now, the cool thing is, these are all claims you can actually test, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. And to back up this idea of incredible precision, Petrie even published this table of measurements. See, by averaging the numbers from four different turns, he tried to argue that it was almost perfectly uniform. But, and this is a big but, Critics have been pointing to this for a long time, calling it a clumsy trick that was basically designed to hide the real irregularities you can see in the actual groove. And you know, for decades, that was pretty much it. The whole debate just went back and forth based on Petrie's words and his data. But then, much more recently, a new generation of investigators decided, you know what? It's time to actually put these claims to the test. So fast forward to the 2000s, an engineer named Christopher Dunn basically reopens this century-old cold case. He manages to get access to core number seven, which is at the Petri Museum in London, and he's determined to see with his own eyes if this legendary spiral is the real deal. And his method was just brilliantly simple. He took a piece of white cotton thread, that's it. He carefully laid it right into one of the grooves and just traced its path around the core. And what he found was pretty incredible. He didn't just think the spiral was real. He concluded it wasn't one single spiral groove, but two of them kind of wrapped around each other. Now that made things more complicated, but for the people who believed in the theory, it just made the mystery even deeper. Like what kind of tool could do that? A little later, Dunn also worked with a latex cast of the core's surface. And this picture here really shows his whole approach perfectly. He drew these idealized perfect lines right on top of the blurry impression from the grooves trying to argue that the pattern underneath was, in fact, a spiral. But you can probably see the problem here, can't you? It's still not direct proof. It's an interpretation drawn over a blurry image. And that right there was the fundamental issue that just plagued this entire debate for more than 100 years. You had both sides arguing passionately about something that, get this, no one had ever actually seen completely. I mean, just think about it. Back in the 1880s, photography was this big, clunky process. Petrie couldn't just snap a bunch of pictures and stitch them together into a 360-degree panorama of the core. But what's really astonishing is that for the next 100 years, nobody else did either. The entire argument was built on words, on measurements of little tiny sections, and these kinds of indirect methods. You know, there's a research paper that put it perfectly. There was no panorama from Petrie, no panorama from anyone. There were just words, words, and words again. That is, until very, very recently. Okay, so this is where the story takes a huge turn. After more than 130 years of arguing back and forth with nothing but speculation and tiny bits of data, modern technology finally steps onto the scene to give us the one thing everyone was missing, 
The date was March 2nd, 2020. This is the day researchers were finally able to do a brand new high resolution photo shoot of core number seven at the Petri Museum. And here it is. For the very first time, a full, complete panoramic image of the surface of core number seven. This is the smoking gun that people had been debating for over a century, but had never actually laid eyes on. Now, finally, Petri's claims could be held up against real, objective, visual evidence. And right away, the new evidence starts to poke some serious holes in one of Petri's key arguments. Remember, he claimed there was a constant pitch of 0.1 inches, which is about 2.54 millimeters. But when you look at these close-ups, well, it's obvious the distance between the grooves is all over the place. It goes from as little as one millimeter to as much as three. So now, with this undeniable visual evidence in our hands, we can finally go back to Petrie's original four claims and see how they actually hold up. So let's do it. Let's deconstruct this myth piece by piece. Okay, first up, Petrie's claim of a continuous groove. Well, one look at the panorama and you can see that's not right. The grooves clearly merge together, they break off into nothing, they split into different paths. And what's really interesting is that both Petrie and even Dunn kind of admitted this in their own writings. They said the grooves get confused and have discontinuity. All right, next up, the fixed cutting tooth theory. Petrie's whole idea was that the tool cut to a perfectly even depth, plowing right through the hard quartz crystals and the softer stuff. But the photos tell a different story. The groove depth is totally unpredictable. That look of it being deeper in the quartz, it's actually just an illusion. It's caused by the brittle edges of the quartz crystals crumbling away, which makes the sides look higher. So let's just take one last look at the full panorama here. The big claims, constant pitch, continuous lines, stable depth, they just don't seem to survive a simple visual check, do they? But the final nail in the coffin, the real proof, comes when we actually trace what's there. Okay, so what you're seeing now is that same panoramic image, but geologists have gone over it and painstakingly traced every single visible groove on the surface. And by doing this, we can finally get rid of all the guesswork and just see the raw pattern that the ancient tool actually left behind. And here's the final undeniable result. When you strip away the granite background and you just look at the lines themselves, the picture becomes crystal clear. There is no regular, continuous, true screw thread. It's just not there. As the researchers themselves put it, the lines converge, diverge, break, and behave in all sorts of other similar, non-graceful ways. So there you have it. The visual evidence seems to have finally put that century-old myth of the perfect spiral to bed. These marks are clearly not the product of some kind of precision machine, like Petrie thought. But, and this is the cool part, that just leads us to a brand new and maybe even more interesting question. If it wasn't a fixed machine-like tool, then how in the world were these complex, messy, irregular grooves made in solid granite? It just goes to show, sometimes debunking one mystery just opens the door for a whole new one to begin.